what you will do when patient with a head injury is telling nursing officer please watch at my ear something is leaking from my ear and what you will do when the patient with head injury says you sir something is leaking from my nose so how you will calculate the cerebral perfusion pressure when the examiner ask in the aims nurse at mains exam so let me discuss each and every questions in this very important today's topic related to the management of the head injury and intracranial pressure so myself mr nagraj your nurse at mentor and guide so discussing the very important topic of your nurse at exams and other very important competitive nursing exams so related to a management that including the nursing management a medical management and the surgical management on the patient of head injury and increased intracranial pressure before moving to our very important class here is the beautiful motivational quote for you all the best view comes after the hardest climb students nothing will come to you easily okay if you are working hard if you are struggling to exist in the field of the competition so the best view comes to in front of you definitely one day when you will reach your the peak of your work the peak of your action so without wasting the time we will start the today's today's very important class that is management of increased intracranial pressure so what is the first priority nursing responsibility in the patient with increased intracranial pressure means we have to yes we have seen the nice guidelines in the last slide in the previous class here is the our nice guidelines that is the national in institute of clinical excellence guidelines for the assessment of the patient with the head injury as yes. all first patients or the clients which comes with the history of head injury you will always suspect those patient for the spinal injury in all the patient with the head injury why because from the cervical spine number 4 the nerve root which is going which supplies to our diaphragm muscle of the yes, respiratory system so diaphragm is the very important and main muscle of respiration which is supplied by the yes c4 root that is the nerve name is the phrenic nerve okay so a phrenic nerve if this nerve get got damaged means there is a paralysis of the diaphragm the paralysis of diaphragm leads to the a respiratory arrest respiratory arrest leads to the death of the patient so in order to prevent this one we will always suspect all the head injury patient for the cervical spine injury in order to prevent the yes respiratory arrest and death of the patient okay so here is the nice guidelines when we will assess for the glasgow coma scale and patient with the head injuries like this in first two hours we will assess for 30 minutes every 30 minutes once and in next four hours we will assess every once every hourly once and in the next six hour after head injury we will assess every second hour okay this is the national institute of clinical excellence guidelines for your assessment of the patient with the head injury okay so here is the management so as a nursing officer your work is to prevent the patient for the cerebral hypoxia what is cerebral hypoxia cerebral in the sense yes related to the brain what is the hypoxia hypoxia is decrease oxygen in tissue that is called hypoxia okay <clears throat> when hypoxia occurs hypoxia occurs due to the hypoxemia what is hypoxemia decrease oxygen in yes the blood circulation that is called hypoxemia so due to the hypoxemia hypoxia occurs due to the hypoxia there is decrease oxygen and nutrient supply to the brain so due to decrease oxygen supply to the brain we call that is the yes cerebral hypoxia so in patient with the raised intracranial pressure that is the first thing we have to do is to prevent the cerebral hypoxia how you will prevent the cerebral hypoxia yes we need to monitor the patient for the respiratory status whether his respiratory rate is normal whether his respiratory efforts are normal whether he is involving the ex extra muscles for his respiration yes that is what we need to assess here and 
we need to prevent the respiratory depression how we will prevent the respiratory depression we need to withhold all those medication which are causing the respiratory depression the very important frequently asked questions related to respiratory depression on the yes which medication that is none other than your morphine sulfate morphine sulfate is an opioid analgesic the side effect of the morphine sulfate is the yes, respiratory depression if the patient went in respiratory depression means there is no oxygen exchange there is no oxygen exchange leads to the hypoxemia means decrease oxygen in the blood there is decrease oxygen in the blood in, leads to the hypoxia which leads to the cerebral hypoxia if in case patient went in the cerebral hypoxia means so the death of the brain cells occurs that is what we need to prevent in the patient with the head injury and increased intracranial pressure so after stabilizing the cervical spine will see the respiratory efforts of the patient in order to prevent the cerebral hypoxia okay and we need to monitor the and maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure as in 60 mm of hg okay what is the cerebral perfusion pressure cerebral perfusion pressure is what is the cerebral cerebral is the the brain the perfusion means the blood supply to the brain the pressure means the tension which is present in the cerebral blood vessels which are supplying to the brain that is called cerebral perfusion pressure okay so the normal cerebral perfusion pressure ranges from the 60 to yes 100 mm of hg but in patient with increased intracranial pressure our target cerebral perfusion pressure is only 60 mm of hg that is very very important question for your nurse what is the target cerebral perfusion pressure we need to maintain there with is only 60 mm of hg because increased cerebral perfusion means there is increased blood supply increased blood supply means there is increased plasma leakage increased plasma leakage leads to the increased intracranial pressure that is what we don't want okay that's why we need to maintain the cerebral perfusion pressure to minimum and to the requirement of the cerebral cells okay so very important that is the cerebral perfusion pressure we need to maintain 60 mm hg here is the examiner ask one very very important question to calculate the cerebral perfusion pressure yes aspirants how you will calculate the cerebral perfusion pressure cerebral perfusion pressure is the blood flow supply pressure to the brain means the pressure that is present in the blood vessels of the brains while left ventricular contraction that is what we call the cerebral perfusion pressure okay so how you will calculate the normal cerebral perfusion pressure is yes 60 to 100 mm of hg is the normal cerebral perfusion pressure how you will calculate yes i will give one clinical question for you one patient he admitted to the yes emergency department and the nursing officer assesses his blood pressure his sbp is 120 and his diastolic blood pressure is 90 mm of hg yes and when we assess the intracranial pressure of this patient so it is around 15 mm of hg what is the cerebral perfusion pressure of this patient yes calculate the cerebral perfusion pressure of this patient very important how you will calculate the cerebral perfusion pressure yes let me answer the formula of this cerebral perfusion pressure is like this mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure is equal to yes cerebral perfusion pressure intracranial pressure in the mean arterial pressure so the mean arterial pressure in the intracranial pressure na no deduct madidre namage cerebral perfusion pressure sigutte okay so heg nen pitko beko nodi so idu cranium ide idrolagade already pressure ide okay idike blood supply ide here is the blood supply so this is the pressure inside the blood vessels cerebral blood vessels and here is the pressure from inside the cranium that is the icp when we deduct this icp from this mean arterial pressure which is supplying to the brain so we will get the yes our how much the blood is supplying to the brain that is the cerebral perfusion pressure at what pressure the blood is supplying to the brain that is we will calculate here that is our cerebral perfusion pressure let me calculate the first the bp given 120 as systolic 90 as diastolic okay so first we need to calculate the mean arterial pressure in order to calculate the 
yes the cerebral perfusion pressure here is one beautiful simple formula to calculate the mean arterial pressure that is the map is equal to mean arterial pressure is equal to 1 into systolic blood pressure yes plus 2 into diastolic blood pressure divided by 3 okay this is how we will calculate our mean arterial pressure so we will put our values here 1 into sbp is 120 plus 2 into dbp that is our diastolic blood pressure they given as a 90 okay In scenario, how much I give under the absolute blood pressure? That is 120 by 90. Okay, so I am putting here the 120 by as the systolic blood pressure. Diastolic is the 90, and so we have our formula is 1 into SBP plus 2 into DBP divided by 3. Okay, so let me calculate this one. 1 into 120 is 120. 2 into 90 is 80. Okay, 120 plus 80 is yes, it's in 300. 300 divided by 3 is Yes, it's an hundred. So our mean arterial pressure is hundred mm of Hg. Very important. The normal mean arterial pressure is hundred mm of Hg, which ranges from eighty to hundred. Okay, which ranges from the eighty to hundred mm of Hg. Very important. So let me find out or calculate the cerebral perfusion pressure here. Okay. So we got the mean arterial pressure as an hundred. What I told cerebral perfusion pressure is uh, when we deduct our mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure is equal to cerebral perfusion pressure. So patient with head injury, this is the one uh, SBP DBP. We calculated the mean arterial pressure through this, and here we are having the intracranial pressure as a 15. That will the examiner will give in the exam. Okay, so cerebral perfusion pressure minus cerebral perfusion pressure is equal to mean arterial pressure minus S. Intracranial pressure that is 15 mm of Hg given in the data. So what is our cerebral perfusion pressure? Yes, cerebral perfusion pressure is here. It comes the 85 mm of Hg. Okay. So this is the what the cerebral perfusion pressure we have calculated by the given data. This is what the examiner also ask in exam how to. I told how to calculate the cerebral perfusion pressure. Okay, first but through the given data, we need to calculate the mean arterial pressure. That is the one into SBP plus two into DBP divided by three. So, uh, in the when the mean arterial pressure result comes, in that we have, we need to deduct the intracranial pressure that is given in our question data. Okay, so here it comes our cerebral perfusion pressure is an 85 mm of Hg. Okay, so this is how we will calculate the cerebral perfusion pressure. Okay, so our target cerebral perfusion pressure in patient with the head injury is yes, 60 mm of Hg. I told here. Okay, so let me move for next one. So what is the target partial pressure of carbon dioxide on ventilator? We need to maintain in the patient with the increased intracranial pressure is that is we need to maintain the less partial pressure of the carbon dioxide around. 30 to 35 mm of Hg we need to maintain. So what is the normal partial pressure of the carbon dioxide in our brain? That is the yes, 35 to 45 mm of Hg is the normal partial pressure of carbon dioxide that is present in our brain. So here we will maintain some least range of the partial pressure of carbon dioxide because in order to vaso constrict in order to constrict the blood vessels of the brain so if you are constricting the blood vessels of the brain decreases the blood supply or the flow to the brain so which decreases the intracranial pressure okay so it decreases the icp very important okay so this is what we need to maintain the lower range of the Partial pressure of the carbon dioxide in patient with the yes increased intracranial pressure. In order to decrease the further increase in the intracranial pressure, if the patient on the ventilator, we will set the partial pressure of carbon dioxide as 30 to 35 mm Hg. So it constricts the blood blood of the brains. So decreases the blood flow to the brains. When there is decreased blood flow to the brains, there is decreased intracranial pressure. Okay. So decreasing the blood flow of the brain brain it doesn't mean that. Complete withholding the blood flow of the brain. 
So we, we are completely withholding the blood flow to the brain means we are holding the life of the patient. Okay. So here is the next point. Uh, in management of the increased intracranial pressure, we need to avoid a further increase in the intracranial pressure by following certain steps or points. So you will educate the patient to avoid the strainful activity which increases the intracranial pressure. Which all are the activities which increases the intracranial pressure? What all are the activities which will increase pressure in other compartments of the body or which leads to indirectly increases the intracranial pressure in our brain? So if the intrathoracic pressure increases means intracranial pressure increases. How? How means intrathoracic pressure increases which compresses on the Yes, our internal jugular vein. So, the internal jugular vein comes from the, yes, the brain, which drains from the, the facial part in the brain. So, where there is a congestion of the internal jugular vein, so there is congestion in the brain also. So, it increases the intracranial pressure. So, this is what our intra-abdominal pressure, intra-thoracic pressure, which indirectly increases the intracranial pressure. So, in order to prevent the increased intracranial pressure, we need to Avoid the strainful activity and avoid the increase in the intrathoracic pressure and avoid increase in the intra-abdominal pressure. Okay, very important point. So, to avoid the strainful activities like sneezing, coughing, nose blowing vigorously and uh, weight lifting, we need to avoid such kind of the things in order to prevent the further rise in the intracranial pressure. And we need to avoid in the patient with the head injury, we will Ask the patient to don't shake the head vigorously or don't move the head suddenly. So, which increases the intracranial pressure. Okay. So, and we will ask the patient to exhale. Very, very important point or the five star point for your exams. Okay. So, we will ask the patient to exhale while shifting the patient from bed. Okay. While shifting the patient from the bed. So, we are shifting the patient at the lower end of the bed to the upper end of the bed means. Will, while moving the patient upward, we will ask the patient to exhale or we are shifting from the patient from as bed to the wheelchair or wheelchair to the bed, we will ask the patient to exhale. Why? Why we will ask? Because while shifting, if the patient exhaling means he will not hold his breath. If he is not hold his breath means there is no increase in intrathoracic pressure. There is no increase in intrathoracic pressure means there is no increase in the Yes, intracranial pressure. That's what we will educate the patient to exhale while changing the position on the bed or off the bed. Very, very important in order to prevent the increase in the intracranial pressure. Okay, very important. And we will prevent the shivering and seizure of the patient. Why we will prevent the shivering? If the shivering occurs, means the body temperature increases. Why the body temperature increases in the shivering? Because in the shivering, each and every muscle friction occurs. So, the muscle friction which suddenly increases the body temperature of the patient. So, increased body temperature leads to increased metabolism. Increased metabolic rate late, late, increased metabolic rate leads to the so increased heart rate. Increased heart rate means increased blood supply to the brain. Increased blood supply to the brain leads to the Increased intracranial pressure, that is what we don't want. So, in order to prevent that one, we will give a paracetamol and the muscle relaxants to the patient with the, yes, the head injury in order to prevent the hyperthermia and in order to prevent the shivering, okay? Very important. And we will prevent the seizure also. Same in the seizure, there is a vigorous movement of the body muscles due to the motor activities, or motor abnormalities in the seizure or else, the abnormal electrical activity which occurs in the brain also increases the intracranial pressure. In order to prevent the rise in the intracranial pressure, we will take precaution against the seizures also and to prevent the shivering and the hyperthermia also. So, this is our nursing responsibility to prevent shivering, hyperthermia and seizure precautions in nursing. Okay. So, let me move for the next point that is the provide non-stimulating environment to the patient. So, indirectly or directly which prevents the shivering. So, if we are putting the patient in non-stimulating environment like low light stimuli, low noise, low external stimuli. So, at that point of the time, 
so there is less risk of the occurrence of the seizure so there is no seizure means there is no further rise in the icp this is the, the points which all are you have to keep in your mind while going to your exams so how we will avoid the further rise in icp means we will follow these very important points okay and so other points also very important in order to prevent the increased intracranial pressure the fluid limit of the raised icp patient is only less than 1.2 liter per 24 hours or per one day okay and we need to monitor the intake output chart of the patient in order to calculate the yes the fluid restriction values okay and very importantly we have, we need to avoid the valsalvas maneuver so okay valsalvas maneuver that is very very important in patient with icp we need to avoid the valsalvas maneuver why because what we will do in the valsalvas maneuver we will educate the patient to take deep breath hold and strain take deep breath hold and strain what we will say take deep breath hold and strain that is what the valsalva maneuver which is usually used while extubating the patient or while removing removing the ng tube and while removing the chest tube insertion too so in order to prevent the injury to the lung tissue so we will ask the patient to take deep breath and hold and strain like this so that particular tube or the needle which comes easily outside so we will educate the patient to do valsalva maneuver while removing the tube catheters so but we will not encourage to do the valsalva maneuver in patient with the raised icp because valsalva maneuver what we are doing taking deep breath and holding means the intrathoracic pressure is increasing which leads to the indirectly increasing the intracranial pressure so valsalva maneuver is contraindicated so very important yes morphine sulfate also contraindicated and the valsalva maneuver is also contraindicated okay very important and a position which we need to give in the patient with the increased intracranial pressure means we need to elevate the head of the bed to the 30 degree or to, to 45 degree and which encourages to drain the or which helps to drain the the venous blood supply of our patient or intracranium through the yes, internal jugular vein so if the patient is in the flat position means so the blood flow may be less if he is head of the bed is elevated like this means the blood flow comes easily and the venous returns comes easily back so there is no any congestion no any congestion means no increase in the intracranial pressure that's what we will give the yes head of the bed 30 degree elevated in the patient with yes increased intracranial pressure and the Trundenberg position is contraindicated okay what is the Trundenberg position that is the foot end elevation and head end lower side so this is what we call the Trundenberg position so where we will give the Trundenberg position yes in patient with shock and in the OBG where you will give the Trundenberg position when there is an yes tell me when there is an card prolapse at that point of the time we will give the Trundenberg position and Nietzsche's position also will give there and in the shock we will give the Trundenberg position but in increased intracranial pressure patient if you are giving the Trundenberg position means the venous blood flow comes like this and which further increases the intracranial pressure so Trundenberg position is contraindicated in the patient with raised intracranial pressure very very important okay have to keep in your mind okay yes here is the uh, we have discussed the how we will control and manage the raised intracranial pressure so now we will see the how we will manage the patient with head injury and his complaints okay very important so we will apply all those measures which are we have studied above in order to decrease the increased intracranial pressure in the patient with the head injury and with that uh, we will assess the patient if on examination patient is telling or if when we examine the patient if, if we found the nasal drainage means something which is leaking from the nose means we will don't clean the nose very important we will not insert anything inside the nose and don't suction the nose and don't blow the nose very very important because 
the vigorous cleaning of the nose and the suction and yes the blowing of the nose which further increases the intracranial pressure so if the patient is telling you if something leaking means first what have you have to do means you have to inform yes the doctor or the primary health care provider so after that you have to confirm whether it is in csf yes you have to confirm how you will confirm that one by doing the hollow sign okay what what is the hollow sign or the ring sign when we will take the gauze pad the drainage which which is coming from the nose of the patient will collect in this gauze pad so when there is in concentric ring a red color blood blood ring followed by an yellow color dispersion so which indicates the csf yellow color dispersion is present means that is then positive hallucin which indicates the yes the presence of the csf the csf is leaking from the our nose so that's that is what we call the rhinorrhea okay so and in the patient with the rhinorrhea we will don't insert nasal catheter we will not insert any kind of the nasal catheter in order to feed the patient or in order to establish their way so we will not insert anything in the nose especially we will not insert the nasal catheter okay because if you are inserting the nasal catheter means if the ethmoid or the sphenoid bone is got damaged means the catheter directly enters inside the brain that may damage our yes the very important parts of the brain so we will not insert anything inside the nose we will not clean the nose don't suction the nose don't blow the nose and do not insert anything inside the nose very importantly and the first priority nursing responsibility goes to first we will inform the primary healthcare provider followed by we will check the whether the hyaluronic acid is present or the glucose is present in that leakage okay we will check for the glucose by strip test in order to confirm whether it is in csf or not okay so very important and if on examination or when the patient complains there is something leaking from the ear if that is a csf or we call that is an otorrhea okay at that same point we don't clean the ear by inserting anything in the ear just we we, we will apply the sterile dressing over the ear okay in order to prevent the pre infection okay so the nursing responsibility is to whatever the discharge coming so we will monitor the discharge for the glucose by the strip test and hallucin or the ring sign in order to confirm whether the leakage is csf or not okay the leakage is csf or not so in order to confirm that we will do the hallucin and we will do the ring sign okay hallucin ring sign double ring sign all is similar only okay and we will confirm with the whether the particular discharge is having the glucose if there is a positive glucose means yes it is in csf okay here is the what is the priority in patient with the head injury means will yes the net also nice guidelines also sells first cervical spine stabilization we will do by cervical collar or to if the, to ship the patient to hospital or in inside the hospital in order to turn the patient we will use one very important technique that is the log roll technique okay in log roll technique what we will do if the patient is lying supine like this means so for healthcare provider is very necessary here so one healthcare provider holds at the head end and one at the shoulder one at the hip and one at the foot end so if you ship the patient or if you turn the patient all together four healthcare providers together ship to the patient or turn the patient to the necessary side without bending the cervical spine or the lumbar spine or the yes the coccyx spine never ever bend any spinal uh, spine or vertebrae so that may lead to the further injury in order to prevent the further injury we will use the as yes, the very important log roll technique to change or ship the patient okay very importantly okay after the cervical spine stabilization we will focus on the airway so we will avoid the uh, all the respiratory depressants medications and all and we will uh, assess the airway of the patient so whether the airway is clear or not whether the tongue fall is there or not so if there is a clear airway we will go for the breathing uh, we will assess the breathing by uh, looking over the yes the chest expansion if bilateral equal chest expansion is there means 
yes only at injury is there there is no any flail chest and all okay and that's the normal breathing and you will assist for the circulation okay abc will say so this is the priority with head injury patient we will first stabilize the cervical spine of the patient rest all the abc comes up to that okay very important here is the one more instruction so prevent the neck flexion very important while studying the clinical manifestations in the patient of the increased intracranial pressure and head injury i told you guys the reason neck rigidity means the neck is rigid stiff so but we will not assess the neck rigidity in patient with the head injury until the cct the brain and the spinal x ray takes because we will confirm whether the spinal cord injury is occurred or not if there is no any spinal cord injury then only we will assess for the spinal cord or the neck rigidity until and unless the spinal cord injury is ruled out we will not assess any neck rigidity that is very important that, that is only the point is saying here don't assess the neck rigidity until the spinal cord injury ruled out okay very important okay and the, maintain the normal thermal environment to decrease the body temperature so it is very much necessary if the body temperature is normal means yes the metabolism also normal the blood supply to the brain also normal the normal blood supply to the brain leads to the yes the normal intracranial pressure if the increased intracranial temperature increased metabolism yes increased metabolism increased heart rate increased blood supply increased intracranial pressure so that's what we will maintain the normal temperature normal metabolism normal heart rate very important here is the medical management until we studied the nursing management and the nursing officer responsibility we have seen in patient with head injury and intracranial pressure we will see the medical management of the patient with head injury and inter increased intracranial pressure so to treat the increased intracranial pressure we will use the osmotic diuretics that is the mannitol 20 percentage we will use the very important that is an hyper osmotic agent what is the hyper osmotic agent hyper osmotic means yes the osmolality of the agent is more than the plasma osmolality okay so very important here is your blood vessel and here is the brain so if you are giving the mannitol 20 here means it's a hyper osmotic hyper osmotic agent means the particles are more here means it's a concentrated one so it sucks the fluid from cerebral cells into the intravascular place so decreased fluid in the cerebral blood cells decreased fluid leads to the decreased intracranial pressure how the mannitol 20 that is the hyper osmotic agent or the we will say the osmotic diuretic also this one so this is how we will decrease the intracranial pressure by using the osmotic diuretic that is the mannitol 20 percentage after that we will use the corticosteroids also very important so corticosteroids maintain, maintains the s yes, this is the cell membrane uh, so it maintains the prevents the leakage between the s yes, the cell membrane so there is no leakage means there is no any leakage of the fluid also there is no any leakage of the fluid means there is no inflammation of the brain so decreases the inflammation of the brain and very importantly which there is no leakage means there is no fluid shifting to the brain cells so there is no fluid shifting to the brain cell means there is which decreases the icp also very much helpful so use of the corticosteroids are it stabilizes the cell membrane very important why have i have written here means this is the only points which will ask in your exam what is the use of the corticosteroid in patient with the increased intracranial pressure you will use to stabilize the cell membrane that prevents the leakage of the blood brain barrier yes which further decreases the brain inflammation very important and we will also use the anti seizure medications anti seizure medications are the medications which are given to decrease the seizure or epilepsy okay so there is i told if the seizure comes means the ic prices in order to decrease the intra icp okay so we will prevent the seizure okay and the antipyretic and the muscle relaxant muscle relaxant will how you will give the muscle relaxant in order to avoid the shivering what i told in the shivering so there is an 
vigorous muscle of movements of the muscles so which increases the temperature which increases the metabolic rate so which leads to the increase in intracranial pressure okay and antipyretic also will due to decrease the metabolic need okay very important and right? will due to decrease the is yes, the fever or the increased body temperature here is the very important medical and nursing management of the patient with the head injury so now we will see the surgical management of the patient with the head injury in sweet and short i will tell here okay very important if due to any obstruction in the flow of the csf the csf is getting accumulating in the ventricles of the brain means it will create an opening three or cranium and we will insert one shunt or one catheter from the yes or brain ventricles to or peritoneum okay so that is from ventricle to peritoneum which we will call that is an vp shunt or ventricular peritoneal shunt okay so we call this is an vp shunt or ventricular peritoneal shunt very important so which drains the csf from the yes, brain ventricles into the our peritoneum from peritoneum it comes to our circulation and through there it excretes out okay very important so the aspirants you are seeing you are observing the length of this shunt or the catheter here why it is extra coiled here like this are you able to see over here see why it is bent or why it is extra why it is extra means so usually we will insert this vp shunt in the children with the hydrocephalus or increased intracranial pressure so in order to drain the csf so as the children's growth is much faster in the speed so if the growth occurs early means this the particular shunt which will comes out of the peritoneum that is what we don't want because it, it if it is draining in the peritoneum means the peritoneum having the high it is a highly vascular so it sucks the, the particular fluid and helps to excrete through the our circulation. So we'll keep it extra length because if the height of the person is increasing also, this particular end of the tip end should be in the peritoneum. That is the reason why we'll keep it extra coil. Okay, so very important. If in case. <coughs> In case of the blood accumulation in the cranium or any tumor in the cranium, we will surgically open the cranium that is what we call the craniotomy. What is craniotomy? Craniotomy is surgically opening of the cranium that is called craniotomy. Otomy, wherever the word otomy comes, it is a simple meaning of opening. Okay, so very important. So, we will do the craniotomy in order to in patient with the head injury or else in the patient with the as the brain tumor due to which increases the intracranial pressure. If you will, we will be doing the craniotomy and opening the cranium. So, from there we will suck out that particular blood collected in the cranium. Okay, very important. And the approaches of the craniotomy like this with the position of the patient with the craniotomy we will discuss here. So, Approach of the craniotomy is like this in infratentorial craniotomy, supratentorial craniotomy, and transpenoidal craniotomy. Yes, one more, one more is there, there. That is the posterior fossa craniotomy. Very important here. Look at these words supratentorial and infratentorial. What is there? Supra infratentorial means supra means. Upward, sir. Infra means downward, sir. That is everyone knows. What is the exact point? See, look over here. This is our brain. Here is the brain stem. So, behind that, here is our little brain, what we call the little master. Cerebellum. This is the cerebrum. Okay. This is cerebrum. This is bellum. So there is, I told, there are meningeal layers, which three layers which are covering the brain and spinal cord, where the dura mater fold in between cerebrum and cerebellum, that is what we call the tentorium. 
So above this tentorium, we call supratentorium. Below this tentorium, we call the infratentorium. If the craniotum is opening here, the open is here means we call this is a supratentorial craniotomy. And if the opening is here, cerebellar opening, means we call this is an infratentorial craniotomy. Very important. Okay. So in supratentorial craniotomy, what we will do? Which position we will give? Very important positions which we will ask, ask in our nurse examination. So in patient with the infratentorial craniotomy means the craniotomy is below the tentorium in the cerebellum. So area at that area we will give the patient with flat position without head of the bed elevation. Okay, we will give the flat position in patient with infratentorial craniotomy. Okay, here it is. And in case of the supratentorial craniotomy means you will elevate the head of the bed to the yes the 30 degree. Okay. What is the degree we will maintain here? 30 degree head of the bed elevation you will do. And in case of transpinoidal craniotomy, what is transpinoidal? We are breaking the spinoid bone here. Okay. So that is what we call the transpinoidal. How? Means in between the upper lip and our upper gum. So there is spinoid bone excess will occur. So, how we will do the hypophysectomy means the removal of the hypophysial gland that is our S, the pituitary gland removal. How we will do? By our transpinoidal approach. Okay. Transpinoidal approach means we will go through the spinoid bone that is how we will access easily. We will approach is between the upper gum and the upper lip. Between that we will go for there. Okay. Very important. Transpinoidal craniotomy. So, in the transpinoidal craniotomy, we will maintain the head of the bed again 30 degrees Celsius. Okay, very important. Sorry, degree Celsius, not degree Celsius. Same 30 degree. So this is how we will main maintain the patient of the craniotomy. So if the video found informative to you all, so please share the video and subscribe to my channel. You will get the more informative videos like this. Okay, thanks for watching the video till then. Thank you so much.